So I, I got a request from a gentleman on YouTube um, just asking what advice I would have for somebody moving um, uh, into luffing booms and saddle boom uh, tower cranes. And so um, luffing booms are the ones that go up and down and saddle booms are the ones that are, you might hear the term uh, hammerhead as well for those that just goes basically straight up. They're not straight out, they, they have a pitch up of 3.5 degrees usually. Um, but uh, generally they're straight out, right? And so he, he was asking what, what uh, he should know about them. And so I asked him what uh, experience he has. You know, is he a banksman, a signal person? Um, is he, is he ran other cranes? And so he said he runs an overhead crane and a foundry. So uh, an overhead crane and a foundry, um, you have four directions that you're moving, plus up and down. So a total of six, uh, which is similar to what we have, but uh, they're done differently and the crane doesn't have as many dynamics to deal with because it's really solidly built um, when you're an overhead crane um, and when you're looking at the load either you're going to be up on the crane if it's a really large one like uh, Boeing we move around up here we move around big uh, plane fuselages and sp wing spars and so they have an overhead crane where people are up on there and they're looking straight down on the load. Um, tower cranes, you're not looking straight down on the load. Um, and so you, you have tricks that you use to deal with that. Um, and, or you're going to be on the ground looking straight up. And you, you just don't have those luxuries when you're in a tower crane. So you have to deal with uh, how to sight in a load properly. Hopefully you have a good signal person, banksman. Um, and then, uh, but you, you still want to be double checking them. So how do you do that? So I've got some tri tricks for that as well. So I'm going to talk about dynamics of the loading of the crane, I'm going to talk about dynamics of the tower torque, and then a few tips and tricks uh, for how to sight in a load properly and double check yourself. Uh, not all cranes, I'm in a 1981 crane right now, so I have no computer controls whatsoever in this. And so it's uh, the old school way of trying to figure out how to uh, double check the guys on the ground. So got some tri tips for that, and uh, let's uh, take a look at some of those. Tower torque is a concept that really only applies to uh, tower cranes out of all the cranes. It's pretty unique um, because basically you're sitting on top of a mast and then you have another crane, right? And so what happens is that when you apply power, you're going to get twist out of the tower below you. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to swing left, but what you're going to notice is that the tower goes right first. So you're building up all this, this power and resistance and then the tower pushes you back. Uh, back to the left in this case. So here I go left, got the tower going. And now I'm going to go ahead and let it coast because I don't want the block swinging around too bad. And so I'm letting it drift out. And so I, I when I come to a stop, I, I don't want all that power in there. I have to let it drift as much as possible. So um, if I go ahead and I, and I break hard, and let's do that. Move and swing into the right here. Getting a little bit of speed. So I let it coast for a second, a little bit of the energy come out. Now I'm gonna go ahead and lock the brakes. I just locked the swing brakes, so the crane's coming to a hard stop. And so what happens is that all that energy of stopping the crane reflects down to the base of the crane, where the concrete base is, and then it reflects back up to us. And it does that multiple times. And so now we have the superstructure fighting the resistance of the base on the ground and it's reflecting through that tower back and forth like a wave in a pond, right? And so you have to let that dissipate as best you can. If we did that and we were out 60 meters with the hook, uh, that would be really violent. We're only about 10 meters out right now, so it's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and so it becomes relative to the wind, it becomes relative to uh, how far out, out you are on the hook. So what you want to do is you go ahead and you start your swing. And so I'm swinging with it, getting it going. It's rhythmic. So I've got the coast going now. I'm just letting it drift on through. Occasionally I'll hit it uh, to keep it moving. And it becomes rhythmic with the cranes on the, uh, the old styles like these. So when I want to go ahead and stop that block, I go ahead and I, I swing back against it. So I'm just swinging right. And then I can go ahead and just let it drift and it's stopped moving on its own, so I can go ahead and lock up the brakes. But again, if I, if I do that while it's um, uh, still swinging, I lock up those brakes, you're gonna get those reflections. So you have to deal with that. 
Um, and uh, the amount of power it takes to swing in the wind will vary uh, day by day. So if you're getting uh, 50 kilometer uh, wind, 50 kilometers per hour wind uh, versus say a, a 10 kilometers an hour, it's, you're gonna have to put a different amount of power into it each time. That's uh, pretty uni unique to tower cranes. So something you're gonna have to get used to. So let's see how violent it actually gets when you get going on the towers. So that's full, full power to the right. And, and then I go full power to the left. And it's, that's how much twist you can get out of the, the tower below you. So it's a, li a little bit violent. And, um, and you want to be able to mod uh, modulate that as you're uh, running your crane. So that's another uh, concept you have to get used to. Let's move on to another one. So you were asking about luffing jib cranes. And so here's an example. So we've got our, our load hanging down here, right? Uh, we've got our mass superstructure up here, our twists and turns. And right now I'm a little bit overboomed with the way I drew that. It's just because I'm a terrible artist. So what happens is that... Um, with the dynamic that you have on a tower crane, especially on a luffing crane, it's a little less on a hammerhead saddle jib, uh, but on a luffing crane, uh, you're going to have a lot of tower deflection. So you might see boom flex, which instead of going straight up like that, you put a load on a, uh, on a mobile crane, like a hydraulic crane, and you'll get boom flex where the boom flexes. What happens here is the tower leans forward. So as soon as you go to pick up a load like this, the tower leans forward. So if it's a heavy load, You'll just come up to it and then you'll just start booming up at that point. You don't even worry about continuing to hoist up on a lot of cranes and this will vary based on the load and the size of your crane and you'll have to play with it. But um, that's the concept. So as, as you, uh, like I said, as soon as you get tight on a heavy load, you may end up just booming up. And what you want is you want your bellman, eh, excuse me, you want your bellman hanging out down here looking straight up standing perpendicular and then they can see that so if they see this they'll want to stop the hoist and then just boom up um, and if it's the opposite of course if it's like this then you want to just hoist up and pull the crane over to it um, and what I like to do is I like to put my hand on the load and as I'm watching that because I can feel how much weight is uh, still on the ground you can start to feel it shift and it's like oh am I close um, and so that's uh, one of the concepts you have to deal with in a luffing or saddle saddle jib crane that you don't normally have to deal with in an overhead crane because you don't have that flex going on. It's just another dynamic on top of that tower torque I was talking about. So if you have a computerized crane, one of the tricks that I like to do is take a Sharpie and draw out a map of the job site. This is just a mock-up. Uh, I don't know the actual radius of any of these things uh, because I've got a crane that doesn't have it. So uh, for I've got my core uh, for the elevator. I've got my uh, shear wall. Um, and then I've got each of my columns laid out. And so what this does for me is that when I'm bringing in a column, column form or a concrete bucket, I can nail exactly what that point is for the guys on the ground. There's no adjustment they need to make. It's gonna be perfect every time. And um, so it also it helps me know that in between these two distances, if I'm gonna go somewhere between 63 and 97 feet of radius, then uh, I can go ahead and say I'm going to hit 75 feet and I'll be clear of the core and I'll be clear of this column and down I come. Uh, and unless they need it very specifically, we're not going to have to adjust it. And, and same in between any, any of these tight spots. It's a good second uh, reference to have. If um, I'm, in this case we have tables we're flying up, so the shoring. So today's Thursday. We're gonna uh, everything will be poured out today. The deck and the the core and the columns is why I'm kind of slow and can do this video. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll strip everything. We'll pull all the formwork, and then on Saturday the the concrete deck will get stressed, um, and then by 11 a.m. we'll be pulling up uh, the. Um, the, the decking from below and up to the next floor to build our 11th floor. And if I had a new computer uh, rise crane, I would go ahead and have a second map, just have the columns drawn out and showing where the, each of the uh, decks are, what they weigh, and, and then I can hit those for them every time and pull up the exact amount of weight that they need uh, for that deck. Uh, find a sweet spot between the deck holding it down um, the deck being able to pull itself down but not shock load the crane. Um, and so 
uh, I find this to be an excellent tool um, to use. The only problem with it is you don't want to get too lazy with it. You want to be able to make sure that your brain is reading other um, waypoints and cues that you're in a specific area instead of just relying 100% on the computer. Um, I've never seen a computer problem, but I suppose it would be possible you have a computer problem to give you a false reading. And so you don't want to completely rely on the computer. You want to make sure you're still being an operator when you use this. But really, this is the slick, easy way to go, in my opinion. So I hope that gives you a bit of a start about what some of the differences are. Um, the only thing I haven't really shown is probably the uh, delay difference. So um, on an overhead crane, uh, the highest you're probably going to be is 10 meters probably. Uh, might be a few situations where you're a little taller. but um, So there isn't much delay between the time you start and the block moves. Uh, if you were to start on a tall crane, mine right now, there's about a four second delay between when I move and the block moves. So in that case, um, what's going to happen is that you have to read four seconds ahead, right? And the guys on, on the ground, most of them aren't going to do that. So you're looking to see your swing because you, know, you got a, a radius when you swing, right? So you're dealing with your swing and trolley at the same time, and you're, you're thinking four seconds ahead. Uh, so it's kind of better to start on a smaller crane to begin with, uh, so you don't have to deal with so much delay. Uh, because your brain is going to be overloaded at, at times when you get started. It's just the nature of the beast. At least you got a good start when you're coming out of crane to a tower crane uh, because uh, you're not going to be completely overwhelmed like a brand new guy would be, but you'd be sweating and nervous to start with and then it, you settle in. Just take your time, uh, be safe for everybody and, um, and let them know what you need from them. You have to have good clear communication between you and your signal people to uh, get it done right and uh, be safe. If I can help at any time, let me know. Good luck, man.